Antibiotics are fed to almost all of our conventionally farmed animals. We use them to make these animals grow quicker and faster and fatter. So yeah, mm -hmm. when we eat these animals, uh, we actually are eating the antibiotics that are in their flesh. Those antibiotics kill off our gut microbiome. So rather than having this intense, beautiful, diverse, uh, tropical rainforest of tens of thousands of species of bacteria in our gut, after a course of antibiotics, you may be reduced to one or two bacteria out of 10,000. And it may take two to three years to get that back. I mean, think about it. If, if a forest burns down and we run in there and we plant little seedlings, it's going to take 20 or 30 years to get that forest back. And so we've been really naive. Hi, welcome to the Pretty Intense Podcast. Thank you so much for coming. I am grateful to have you and have you listening. Today we have a treat. It's Dr. Stephen Gundry. He is a brilliant cardiologist, heart surgeon, researcher, and author. He wrote The Plant Paradox, The Longevity Paradox, The Energy Paradox, and his newest book is called Unlocking the Keto Code. So of course we started off with a basis of just kind of ultimate health information. He talks a lot about lectins, gut health, how it works, how your intestines work, and what truly makes you, um, you know, unhealthy. And to some degree that you won't even know. So anyway, it's amazing information, but then of course we get into the keto code and unlocking that. And the information is fascinating. The things that you think that are going to help your body to be the most efficient, energized, and leanest and fittest, like all of a sudden the information is flips on its head. And so we learn about the mitochondria, we learn about MCT oil and the power of that. So it's all about how to access ketosis. Um, anyway, amazing information. I have no doubt that there's gonna be many of you that go out and get not only his newest book, Unlocking the Keto Code, but probably some others. So enjoy the show today. And of course, thank you for coming. If you like what you heard, um, please hit the subscribe button so that you can see much more of my content in the form of clips and other little things that we create for you guys. Again, thanks for coming. Are you practicing right now? Or are you, you say when I the see, nurse can come knock on the door to get you in an hour. I Is see patients, patients. I see patients six days a week, even Saturday and Sunday and Fridays. I'm at Gundry MD, my supplement company. So yeah, I work seven days a week. Holy. And wow. actually, so, you know, I'm one of the few people you're right. Practicing uh, is, the, is the correct word because I everything I talk about, everything I've written is actually based on 25 years of having patients eat certain things, avoid certain things, take a supplement, not take a supplement, you know. And so, yeah, so I'm one of the few people that actually you know, says this is what happens when you do this. And here's 10,000 patients that have done this. But I can't think of a better way for um, someone to be able to actually collect the information and have that beta test with people and be able to see the trends of what's happening and the, the way that things are happening, even in the way that food is made and brought to us and the patterns that fall into place. Like, for example, I tested high for thallium and then hearing like all of a sudden everybody's high for thallium because people are eating kale and kale absorbs thallium. And what's beautiful about your books is that I feel like they really are an evolution. It seems like they build on each other. So I, part of what I want to ask you is a little bit about each book and then end up getting to where you are now. But, you know, also you've said that the number one thing that people come into your office for is um, they want more energy and they don't want to be quite as fatigued. And so where do you start within your practice figuring out what the problem is? Ah, that's a great question. Um, well, you know, Hippocrates said 2,500 years ago that all disease begins in the gut. And he didn't have any of the sophisticated tests we have now. Uh, I don't know how he knew it, but he was absolutely right. And uh, thanks to work, uh, some of my work, work by Dr. Alessio Fasano, who's now at Harvard, who actually proved for the first time that 
uh, certain foods, certain proteins called lectins, he was focused on gluten, um, actually attack the wall of our gut and actually cause the little things that bind our gut cells together, uh, tight junctions, to break and to actually cause uh, spaces between the walls of our gut where not only can foreign food particles come through, but also bacteria. And as I wrote in the last book, The Energy Paradox, um, this creates inflammation uh, locally in our gut. 80% of all of our white cells literally line uh, the intestinal wall, 80%. Oh my and, God. and they're there because that's kind of our border, if you will, with the outside world. And normally that border should be impenetrable, but it's only one cell thick. We, we have kind of a design flaw and <laughs> that the space, the length of our intestines is actually the same as a tennis court. Uh, so, you know, when we're watching the Australian Open, for example, that tennis court is inside of us and it's only one cell thick. So any, anything that can kind of get through that, you know, thin, thin, thin membrane, our immune system goes, oh my gosh, you know, we're under attack mm. and we need, we need all the energy that you have to fight this war that you may not even feel. Now, most people feel it by, you know, fatigue or, you know, other, believe it or not, I see so many, particularly women, uh, with depression and anxiety, and they don't have a clue, unfortunately, that this is actually happening uh, because of this war that's starting down in their gut. You guys uh, have taught me so much, women, <laughs> um, because you guys, thankfully, have a gut feeling. And mm. men, and quite frankly, most medical people have poo-pooed that feeling that women have. Uh, luckily, I have a wife, two daughters, and three female dogs. So, um, <laughs> I, I, I have a, yeah, well, yeah, and luckily, I, I've learned that you know, women have this you know, sense uh, that we should pay attention to. And for the last 20 years, I've been urging women in particular to please keep looking for a healthcare provider who will take your complaints seriously. And once people start doing that, once I started saying, gee, you know, that's, are you sure that that's going on? And I started looking at the blood work and I go, oh, son of a gun, you know, you're right. Um, and let's fix it. Mm. I mean, I'm, I can completely attest to that. I, I think that maybe what could be said is not only to find a practitioner that takes you seriously and is willing to uh, explore what it is that could be causing this, um, what some may think is imaginary symptom, right? Um, but also to you yourself, that person out there to take your symptoms seriously, to take your intuition seriously, probably 2018. I remember thinking to myself, like my body had shifted a little, like, like gained a couple of pounds out of nowhere. And I was like, man, this is so weird. And nothing I did made a dent on it. And I was like, Maybe it's just, I need to try harder. Maybe it's just age. Maybe it's just that. But my intuition said my hormones are off. I probably should check them. Fast forward now into the end of 2020, I had another shift like that. And I was like, okay, this is not okay anymore. And I'm one of those people that does have great energy. And so um, it's not as easily uh, noticed in my world. Um, but then I finally went in and I had a slew of things, including leaky gut, including dysbiosis, including heavy metal toxicity. I mean, just tons and tons of stuff. Thankfully, I felt decent, but you know, the ultimate shift for me was I, I finally had cycle issues. And then I was like, well, I guess I should probably do something about this. Um, so I think that yes, following that intuition and getting in touch with the body and trusting that is a really important thing. So um, do you find that food is the number one culprit? 
Yeah. Um, you know, Hippocrates also said, you know, let food be thy medicine and <laughs> medicine be thy food. He was smart. <laughs> Man, I don't know how he figured all this out. But yeah, so that's, I guess, what made me famous is that a lot of the healthy foods that we think are good for us actually contain um, mischievous little proteins that are the defense system of the plant against being eaten, which are called lectins. And mm -hmm. lectins um, bind to the wall of our gut, and they actually flip a switch that breaks these tight junctions. Hmm. And the object of the game for a plant is not to be eaten mm -hmm. and to make sure that its babies don't get it eaten its seeds and their only defense against being eaten is to try and make their predator in that case us not feel well when we eat certain plants or plant babies and the object of the game is a smart animal if it doesn't feel well, or if it's not thriving, or even if it's not reproducing, the animal says, you know, uh, every time I eat this plant or this plant baby, I don't feel very well. I think I'll go eat something else. Mm -hmm. The plant wins, the animal wins, everybody's happy. Humans, as we all know, are pretty stupid. And so when we eat things that we have an intuition or we can feel that eh, something's not right, we take... You know, we take Prilosec OTC or Tums or Nexium. Uh, we take antidepressants. We take uh, Aleve, Advil. And this actually, as I write in all my books, makes things worse rather mm -hmm. than better. The other thing that I think is really important that I wrote in the last book particularly is uh, we have amazing gut dysbiosis now just because uh, of two things. Number one, the antibiotics that we take uh, for whatever. Um, you couldn't believe the number of people who have been given antibiotics for COVID-19, which they don't work. Uh, it's, a, it's a virus, folks. Um, number two, antibiotics are fed to almost all of our conventionally farmed animals. And we use them to make these animals grow quicker and faster and fatter. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. So when we eat these animals, uh, we actually are eating the antibiotics that are in their flesh. And so unbeknownst to us, those antibiotics kill off our gut microbiome. So rather than having this intense, beautiful, diverse, uh, tropical rainforest of tens of thousands of species of bacteria in our gut, many of us, for instance, after a course of antibiotics, um, you may be reduced to one or two bacteria out of 10,000, and it may take two to three years to get that back. <gasps> No, yeah. don't say that. Yeah, it's unfortunately true. Uh, I mean, think about it. If, if a forest burns down and we yeah. run in there and we plant little seedlings, it's going to take 20 or 30 years to get that forest back. And so we've been really naive that, oh, I can take you know some probiotics the next day and I'll be back to normal. And fortunately, you got to build this ecosystem in your gut. Oh, man. That's yeah. uh that's sad to hear cuz like as a current issue I have like I said dysbiosis and leaky gut and of course that stuff doesn't get tested like monthly but you know I've heard and and please explain this to me and and help us understand that your like your face is basically like the inside out of your gut is that True. accurate mm -hmm. that's accurate great well my gut sucks right now and thank god for makeup but I have um, and I got this like 10 years ago, it's perioral dermatitis or something like that. And it basically looks like a little rash, right? It's like little bumps around your face. And I got it last summer when all of this got tested and then I was running a marathon. So I was training a ton and I've heard that marathons are bad for leaky gut and gut issues. Is that correct? Oh, absolutely. It's yes. one of, it's one of the worst things you can do for your health. No offense. 
I agree. And I was invited to do another one with the girls that did it with me. And I said, absolutely not, but I will cheer you on. Problem is though, is what do you do about it? So like in my situation, I tried to avoid antibiotics. I had a topical steroid. I used it for the last six months. And then I heard it could actually have a, a bad payoff. Like it makes things worse. Is that true too? Well, yeah, topical steroids, I mean, they cover up the problem, but you're right. So what's fascinating is the, the lining of our gut is literally our skin turned inside out. And so what's fascinating is what's happening on the inside wall of your gut, in a way, luckily for many people is expressed on their skin. And mm. so people with psoriasis, people with eczema, to people with dermatitis, mm -hmm. those are actually an external sign that that process is going on on the inside of your gut. So if you think about this, you know, red raw rash, yeah. you go, oh my gosh, you know, my I, got, gosh. I got this red rawness on the inside of my gut and I don't want that. Let's say, let's say you can just let's say, let's say you're someone who can see it on your skin. Maybe, you know, I've heard of a lot of people have, um, you know, avoid gluten or dairy, and that also helps clear their skin up, things like that. So if you're someone out there and you can see it on your skin, that something's going on, what do you do? And in this case, like for even something like what I have going on, the, the general fix usually is an antibiotic, right? I hope not, but oh. you know, well, it, what do we do? Well, so again, this is a sign that the wall of your gut is, is under attack by compounds that produce these gaps in the wall of your gut. Mm -hmm. And, uh, about 80% of all my patients now, uh, have an autoimmune disease that have been kind of all around the country or the world trying to fix because they don't want to go on immunosuppressant drugs or they're on them and want to get off. Mm -hmm. And so we, we do have the benefit of testing people for leaky gut. And we also have the benefit of testing people for food sensitivities. Mm -hmm. And What's fascinating is years ago, we used to do food allergy testings where we put right. like a hundred little pinpricks on your back yep. and see what you reacted to. They're worthless. Um, really? Oh yeah, they're worthless. Oh. I guess one of the reasons I might be believable is I'm willing to say I was wrong uh, based on new data. And yeah, I used to use this, these tests and they're useless because we now have much better tests. Uh, looking at what are called food sensitivities. If you have a porous wall of your gut, if you have intestinal permeability, normally the foods we eat should be broken down by all of our digestive enzymes into simple sugars, simple amino acids from protein, and simple fatty acids from fat. And those should be absorbed through the wall of our gut. But if you've got spaces, gaps, then whole pieces of food that were not broken down properly can actually go across the wall of our gut. So let me give you an example. Um, let's suppose you eat a lot of kale and then we do a food sensitivity test and all of a sudden you react very strongly to kale. And you go, well, what the heck? You know, that's not right. You know, I eat a lot of kale and kale is good for me. Right. Well, what happens is if a whole piece of kale comes across the wall of your gut, your immune system says, what the heck is that? I've never, I've never seen kale before. You know, I've seen simple carbohydrates. That's a foreign protein. That's a foreign body. And I'm going to attack it. And so it's fascinating. Years ago, when we first had these tests, uh, I'll, I'll backtrack for a second, about 90% of people who get my book, The Plant Paradox, or one of the subsequent ones, resolve their autoimmune disease with just by following, don't eat these foods. And, you know, it's exciting um, that that Amazing. works. But about 10% of people, and even 10% of my patients, despite swearing on Bibles or Qurans or whatever, that they're following the rules. They're, they're better, but they're not all the way better. 
And so when we do that, then we go more sophisticated looking for food sensitivities. And I can tell you as a general rule, and I wrote this in my first, in the plant paradox, 70% of people with celiac disease, which is the extreme form of gluten intolerance, mm -hmm. a year and a half after following a gluten-free diet still have celiac disease by intestinal biopsy, which is the gold standard. Why? because most gluten-free foods have lectins that they are reacting to beyond gluten. So 70% of people who are sensitive to wheat are sensitive to corn. 100% of people who are sensitive to wheat are sensitive to oats, including gluten-free oats. Um, they're sensitive to quinoa. They're sensitive to buckwheat. They're sensitive to almost all the pseudo grains and they literally cross react. The other thing that's unique in my troublemaking patients, as I call them, is most of them are sensitive to not only casein A1, which I write about, but also casein A2. Those are the milks, right? Those, those are, the are the milks. The cows, right? Yeah, those are the two different kinds of cows. And most of the really sensitive people are sensitive to egg white and egg yolk. Uh, sorry. Now, yeah, the good news is, and then we do a food sensitivity and quite frankly, almonds show up all the time. Um, when I first did this years ago, we banned almonds, but when I wrote the plant paradox, my editor said, man, you're really mean, come on, give it, you know, give us something. <laughs> and I said, okay, the, the lectin is in the peel of the almond. So you can have blanched almond flour and you can have Marcona almonds and it's worked pretty well, but again, some of my troublemakers, it's almond flour. That's the, the trouble. And when we get rid of that, it's, it's all better. I, I'll give you a great example. Um, uh, as an athlete, um, a couple of years ago, I had an, uh, an NHL hockey player, a young man, 23 years old, who developed Crohn's disease, which is, a, is an autoimmune. And he was having 20 episodes of bloody diarrhea a day. And he was on two immunosuppressants and wasn't getting any better. Uh, he had to drop out of the NHL. He lived with his mother and I, he, he lost 75 pounds. He was a skeleton. And somebody gave him my book, The Plant Paradox, and he started following it. And he got down to about, oh, three to four bloody bowel moves a day, but he, his weight stabilized. So get a cold call from him and said, hey, you know, this is the first thing that has actually worked. Yeah, but I'm not all the way yet. Could we, you know, investigate this further? And I said, yeah, you know, this will be great. So we did all this. And sure enough, uh, he was sensitive to all forms of dairy and all forms of eggs. And, you know, gluten was a disaster. And so was corn, etc. So we took all those away from him. And in three months, he's back having normal bowel movements and he's gaining weight. And he still, still his, he don't, wasn't having any bloody bowel moons, but he says, you know, they're still not formed right. I said, okay, let's, let's do a food sensitivity. And he was having a lot of almond flour bread, almond flour cookies. And sure enough, almond flour and vanilla beans were a couple of his real troublemakers. And so we took them away and he he calls me back his mother and he called me back so that was it that was it he's back to normal and he's back playing now and so oh my god but it was oh. like son of a gun such an investigation it takes so long i mean even i can attest to that you think it's this and then that kind of doesn't work and you go to that and the next thing and the next thing and you kind of just peel away the layers of like what is really the thing and it it takes time so when you execute it it's like Good job. Like that's hard to do. Oh, it's and the very fact hard to that, do. And the fact that your book can do it on its own without actually having to, I mean, this is the ultimate scaling option for someone like you who has this information to be able to write a book to help people because you can't possibly see all the patients that read this book. I still see patients six days a week because uh, it's, it's very hard for me um, to turn people down, uh, unfortunately. Um, uh, the, the, I mean, the heartwarming stories I can tell, like, like this fellow, but 
I mean, we had a little uh, five-year-old child uh, from Texas who's had just his entire palms of his hands and of his feet were just bloody and he couldn't walk. Uh, his mother carried him around all of his life and he'd been everywhere and he couldn't go to school because, I mean, literally his hands were bleeding and his, his feet were bleeding and, you know, people would put him on steroids, blah, 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 and nothing was working. And she wrote me a letter and, you know, I said, oh my gosh, you know, let's see what's going on. Well, this poor young man had just profound leaky gut and a very low vitamin D level. And hopefully we can talk about that. And long story short, it took us a year, but uh, he completely healed his hands and feet. The mother would, you know, send me photographs and we'd talk mm. every three months and we found, you know, what he was sensitive to. And now he's, I think he's uh, nine years old in school, thriving in advanced classes and mom doesn't have to carry him around anymore. That's, you know, and so how can I resist, you know, you know, I have to keep seeing patients because they teach me. Mm. What do you say just to clean it up? Because I know a lot of people that have done uh, uh, a food sensitivity test. Um, and it seems like a lot of times the things that show up on it are the things you eat. Correct. So how accurate is the test itself? And is there a certain gold standard of a company that tests? Like, is there a hierarchy if you just sign up for the one where they send you a box and do the thing, like prick your finger a bit, like, is that enough? Or do you need to go to a certain level to achieve accurate results? And the fact that so many things show up on your diet, that is what you eat. Is that because it's truly aggravating you? Or so, you yeah, uh, it, there's a lot of questions there, but uh, I, personally use a lab called vibrant america i've mm -hmm. used lots of labs to me they're the most accurate mm -hmm. um the and it you know it's gonna cost you to get the the full panel it's gonna cost you about 400 500 bucks uh there are other labs that do them uh cyrex is another one that's quite good but i like vibrant better um your point is well taken. If you're eating a lot of things and you have leaky gut, invariably these things you are going to be sensitized to. Now, the good news, it may take me, somebody else, a year to get somebody's leaky gut sealed. Mm -hmm. I was naive when I started this. I said, ah, a couple of weeks, you'll be fine. <laughs> no. But the good news is once you seal leaky gut, we find that you become desensitized against most of these foods. In fact, I gave a paper at the American Heart Association Lifestyle and Epidemiology meeting two years ago, showing that 94% of people who had celiac disease and profound gluten intolerance in a year, 94% of them no longer had any antibodies to gluten. Their immune system literally was retrained that gluten was not an issue for them anymore. So, I mean, the, and we find that once you seal the gut by removing these things, and once you, you literally can retrain the immune system not to react to these substances. And that's why, uh, so many of my patients, if I can convince them that, yeah, I'm going to make you miserable and the foods I'm going to take away from you. But if we seal your gut, and most of the time we can, we'll get these things back into your diet mm -hmm. and, and it'll be worth it long term. Mm -hmm. Wow. So essentially the like testing for food sensitivities, given the fact that yes, the things that you eat show up in your diet, because of course, like you said, it passes through particles that are way too big. Your body doesn't right. understand it. It hasn't been broken down. So it's really just an indication of in your experience that lectins being probably the number one thing to eliminate, maybe it needs to be a little more specific as it goes, but that is the best starting place because the leaky gut is really just a, uh, the, it's the, 
it's the diagnosis, but it's not necessarily that your food What's sensitivity test can be your, your, your gold, like your, it's not your Bible to what to eat and what not to eat. It's just Correct. saying you have inflammation, you have, your gut is not operating properly. Things are seeping through. And yeah, if you have a diverse diet, you're going to see a lot of stuff on your test and, right. and okay. Interesting. That makes sense because, you know, I mean, in my experience, I had a lot, a lot, a lot of things on my, on my tests that were a level, level, le red level high. Um, okay. You had said that you wanted to talk about vitamin D. Yeah. The so vitamin D, is that a hormone as well? It is a hormone as well. In fact, okay. we should have named it as a hormone long ago instead of a vitamin. But okay. one of the things that I guess didn't surprise me, but maybe surprised me early on when, you know, and I've been working in this area for 25 years now, is that all of these patients who presented with autoimmune diseases, uh, just as a start, had very low levels of vitamin D. And, you know, I went, hmm, that's kind of interesting. Um, and then all of these patients with leaky gut have low levels of vitamin D. And so, yeah, you know, so there's, there's several important things. Um, so vitamin D is a hormone. I've never seen vitamin D toxicity uh, yet. Um, and I've been measuring vitamin D levels every three months for 25 years. Uh, I think a normal vitamin D level should be anywhere from 100 to 150. Uh, even the Cleveland Clinic and Quest now say that vitamin D levels up to 150 are completely normal, not too high. And so I'll push my patients' vitamin D levels up to 100 to 150. Sometimes we'll go higher. Vitamin D does two things. Um, we have, as, as the cells in the wall of our gut are, are hurt by these lectins and other compounds, there's a bunch of replacement cells, stem cells, that are ready to take the place of these damaged cells. It's kind of like the old Revolutionary War movies where you got lots of lines of soldiers <laughs> and the first guys go down and the next guys step up, right? right? Well, that second line has to be pushed into place by vitamin D. They sit there and twiddle their thumbs and go, what, am I supposed to do something? And it's vitamin D that pushes them into place. That's number one. Mm. Number two, we know that people with autoimmune diseases, their immune cells, their white blood cells, normally should be sensitive to vitamin D. Vitamin D basically says, hey, guys, you know, relax. Um, go have a donut and a smoke if we think of them as cops. Um, and that's not to generalize, but just cool it. Don't carry an Uzi around. Every, everything's fine. But we know that people with autoimmune diseases, their immune cells do not listen to vitamin D properly. So you basically have to literally hit them with a sledgehammer to quiet down. So it's this twofold effect. And uh, so almost all human beings should be on 5,000 international units of vitamin D or 125 micrograms. Any of my autoimmune patients, we start them on 10,000 international units. The University of California, San Diego, um, one of the expert centers in vitamin D thinks the average American should take 9,600 international units of vitamin D a day to have an adequate level. The average American. They've found and other people found that you cannot produce vitamin D toxicity at 40,000 international units a day. You're safe. <laughs> You're safe. And I have some of my really tough autoimmune patients on 40, 50,000 a day. Um, Is that because of the bioavailability to their body of what they actually absorb and do something with? Excellent question. It turns out when you've got a leaky gut, you do not absorb it well. And long before we had measurements of leaky gut, I used vitamin D levels to decide when the gut was sealed. And so I'd be pushing, pushing, pushing vitamin D, and I'd have somebody on 30,000 units and, and their vitamin D would be 50. And then on the next blood test, their vitamin D is, you know, 140. And I go, 
great, you know, we're there. Let's start backing down now. And it, it's actually been a very reliable uh, way. So you're right. People with leaky gut, you just can't absorb vitamin D well. And wow. once we seal you, then your vitamin D needs go down. Got it. That makes perfect sense. What are some other kind of hormones that are at play that are uh, big factors in overall health? Well, um, one of the things that I wrote about in the last book, The Energy Paradox, that I think people need to know is glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, is now omnipresent in our diet. It's in, and people, you know, we, we, we learned about Roundup with GMO foods and, mm -hmm. you know, Roundup was developed to, you know, spray soybeans and kill the weeds and the soybeans would die, blah, blah, blah. And so everybody thinks of Roundup as being sprayed on GMO foods, but, and 95% of corn in the United States is genetically modified. Um, same with canola. But now what's happened in the last 10 years is that Roundup is no longer just being used on GMO crops. It's now being used on conventional crops as what's called a desiccant. Uh, these large corporations have to bring these multi-million dollar harvesters to a field on a certain day to be efficient. So rather than wait for the field to ripen and dry, they kill the plants with Roundup and then they die and then they're dry. And so they basically say, okay, you know, field in Iowa number seven is we're going to have the harvesters there on next day, spray it with Roundup so we can harvest it. And so nobody's sitting around washing the wheat or the oats or the corn of Roundup afterwards. They, they don't have to declare it. And so it's fed to our animals. It's fed to us. Almost all grains in the United States are contaminated with Roundup. Almost all vineyards in the United States are sprayed with Roundup to keep Mine's clean, yeah. organic. Yeah. We're organic. Very good. Wine. Bless it's organic. you. Yes. And, uh, you know, and, but yeah. in, Euro in Europe, and it's, you know, it's hard to get uh, organic or biodynamic wine in the United States. And bless you for doing that. Uh, because, uh, you know, most of our wines are contaminated with, with Roundup. Now, why should we worry about that? Well, it turns out that glyphosate is sadly now known to actually cause intestinal permeability, leaky gut, without doing anything else. Mm -hmm. And Roundup is, Roundup was patented as an antibiotic. Glyphosate was patented as an antibiotic. Was it ever administered as an antibiotic first before it became something they sprayed on? Okay, wow. But it's considered an antibiotic. Yeah, it's, it's, it's. Shows what antibiotics do. Exactly. And so one of the things that they assured us was that don't worry, Roundup is not absorbed and it can't kill you because you nice people don't run what's called the shikimate pathway. And that's a really fun word, the shikimate pathway. Sounds and nice. yeah, but, but plants use the shikimate pathway. What they didn't tell us was that our bacteria in our gut use the shikimate pathway. And that's how they patented it as an antibiotic, but they didn't bother to tell any of us. So every time you eat a Roundup sprayed grain or bean or corn, you're inadvertently killing off your gut microbiome and causing mm -hmm. leaky gut even though you're very fastidious about, you know, what, choosing things. And it's apparently allowed and present in, as you said, all even organic products, correct? Yeah. The problem with that is, and that, you know, the Roundup is sprayed on fields and there's wind drift and there's, I, I have a friend uh, who's a biodynamic winemaker in Santa Barbara, Beckman Vineyards, but, hmm. um, 
he's he's all certified organic biodynamic but he's got this one area of his property that's not mm -hmm. certified and i said well why don't you certify that <laughs> he, he said well i can't because the guy next to me sprays with roundup and it drifts and we can detect it so we're not you know we're not gonna you know we're, we we know it wow and, and so and that's part of the problem you know there was a big to do that there were a lot there are a lot of organic oats and oat products that have glyphosate in them and, and oat milk is all the rage my oh friend. i know and oats <laughs> oats are some of the worst lectin containing grains there are and i have so many you know healthy people who are, are developing symptoms of leaky gut and they're having their oat milk and they're having their you know gluten-free oats and when we you know show them the data they go oh my gosh you know what what have i been doing so what are the big buckets of lectins then for people listening where they're like, okay, I need to get started. I'm going to go get your plant paradox book. I'm going to continue on and get the longevity paradox and the energy and all of it. Cause I know this is going to work. Where do they start with the buckets? Yeah. And, and the new book unlocking the keto. Oh, code. we're going to get there next. All I'm right. fast. I'm very curious. That's it. Right. As soon as you answer this, we're all definitely right. getting to unlocking the keto code because I'm kind of fascinated by that. All right. Rule number one is what I tell you not to eat is far more important than what I tell you to eat. So try to stay away from all grains except millet and sorghum. Millet and sorghum do not contain lectins. Okay. All the other grains do. If you gotta have grains like, or pseudo grains like quinoa or buckwheat, pressure cook them. That will destroy the lectins. But you cannot pressure cook wheat, rye, barley, or oats. Uh, it will not work. You cannot destroy gluten with pressure cooking, sadly. Um, that's number one. Number two, beans. Beans and legumes have really high lectin content. However, you can soak your beans and then pressure cook them and you will destroy the lectins. There's two companies now that have pressure cooked beans, Eden and Jovial, and I have no relationship to them. And mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of detoxified beans and lentils. But you got to understand you've got to, you know, de thorn the mischief makers in beans. So are you talking about from a raw bean or are you saying even if it even came a out of a can? Even a, even a can. The only two canned beans that have been pressure cooked are mm -hmm. Eden and oh, Jovial. Wow. Okay. Uh, peanuts and cashews. They are not, uh, they are not nuts. They're actually beans. Right. Cashew is actually a part of the poison ivy family. And there is actually cashew pickers disease. They get terrible burns and boils on their hands. And so if you think it's a good idea to eat poison ivy, then keep eating your cashews <laughs> and your cashew milk. And you Got wouldn't it. believe the number of people with skin rashes that are described in the dermatologic literature that cashews were the culprit. Okay, okay. So just, just think of swallowing poison ivy and then yeah. wondering why you might have something on your face. I'll throw them all away now. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. I've, I've had so many people who've listened to other podcasts and then write me and say, it was the cashews. It, you know, it was the cashew milk and it was the cashew cheese. And <laughs> yeah, thank really. you. Uh, then the nightshade family. Uh, nightshade family, potatoes, eggplant, tomatoes goji berries and peppers. Those are all part of the nightshade family. Not onions? Are no, onions? no, onions are great for you. Yeah, onions, leeks, garlic, uh, they're actually great. really good for feeding friendly bacteria. Great. So those are, those are the troublemakers. Now, the good news about that family in general, the peel and the seeds of tomatoes and peppers are where the lectins are. Um, so if you peel and de-seed them like any good Italian would before making tomato sauce, uh, then you're pretty safe. Okay. All right. Okay. That's amazing. Thank you. All right. Now on to unlocking the keto code. I mean, there's just, you know, there's so, this is such a hot topic. Um, you know, when you just put into like keto fasting, all this stuff, you're just like, okay, carnivore, or even like, you know, feel like Michaela Peterson has made the lion's diet a thing now. So what is it? What are you trying to say with this book? What is the diet? What are you saying is the problem and what is the solution? Well, so I've, I've had a, 
ketogenic version of my, of my diet uh, since I did it. And it's in actually all the books. And interestingly enough, if you look at the ketogenic version of the plant paradox, there's a whole lot of carbohydrates in there and people do extremely well on that program. So when I was doing the energy paradox, my last book, uh, I wanted to kind of explain how ketones made your mitochondria, the little energy producing organelles in all of our cells, really super efficient and really highly efficient at burning fat for fuel. And I like to document with studies, with evidence, what I say. And so as I'm looking up all the studies that I uh, accrued, and started reading them even closer. And I go, wait a minute, this is everything I'm saying and all the keto experts are saying is wrong. Keto is, ketones are a horrible fuel. Uh, they are not some super fuel. They, yeah, sorry. Um, huh. This is. I knew you were gonna tell me something that was gonna be like, what? Yeah, and I go, what? And I go, wait a minute, you know, but uh, you know, I'm teaching and everybody's teaching and all the keto experts are teaching that they're a super fuel and they're not. Uh, this was actually worked out uh, at Harvard and the NIH uh, back in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and even in the 2000s on humans. So um, briefly, um, even at a full ketogenic diet where you're producing massive amounts of ketones. Ketones can only supply 30% of the energy needs of a human being, 30%. And yeah, sorry, um, this was Dr. Owen's work from Harvard, uh, published in 2004. And even at full ketosis, ketones can only meet 60 to 70% of the brain's energy needs. And the brain still needs 30 to 40% glucose, sugar to run. Oh, wow. Cause I feel like the, the word on the street is like, you can use fat for fuel or, or sugar for fuel. Those are your two fuels, That's the main true. fuels that they yeah. use the body uses first. That's true. That's true. Um, muscles will use ketones after a three-day starvation fast muscles will use ketones as a fuel mm -hmm. but as you go beyond three days muscles shift to using free fatty acids as a fuel and could care less about ketones um mm -hmm. so what are ketones doing well ketones free fatty acids our mitochondria love they'll make they'll make atp just fine the problem with free fatty acids are that they're too big to get through what's called the blood brain barrier it's literally a barrier for things to pass through to get to the brain mm -hmm. and so you could have free fatty acids floating all around uh but they can't get to the brain so and what, what do we get free fatty acids from so free fatty acids come out of our fat okay Okay. So it's, just, we, it's, it's some energy that gets liberated from the fat that can be used in the body. Correct. As okay. a fuel. Okay. Your mitochondria normally, if you have what's called metabolic flexibility, you should be able to burn sugar as a fuel. And then as the sugar dries up, you shift to burning free fatty acids as a fuel. And the best example is a hybrid car. Uh, while you're burning gasoline, you're hopefully charging the battery. So it's like, well, you're eating carbohydrates and protein, whatever is extra, you'll put into storage as fat. If the gasoline runs out, then we call on the battery to start supplying power for, you know, keep us moving. So the fat is our battery and free fatty acids are broken, pulled out of the battery to power the engine when glucose is no longer available. That's how we're designed. Now, the bad news is that, and I talk about this in the book, 50% of normal weight Americans do not have metabolic flexibility. 50% cannot switch, cannot tap their battery. 
overweight Americans, 88% of them are metabolically inflexible. Mm -hmm. And obese Americans, 99% are metabolically inflexible. So yes. the important thing about this with ketones is that ketones are only made normally by free fatty acids coming out of fat cells, going to the liver, and the liver converts them into short chain saturated fats that are water, water soluble called mm -hmm. ketones or ketone mm -hmm. bodies. And they can go to the brain and serve as a temporary emergency fuel for the brain until we find some glucose. Okay. So it doesn't get used right away. It's just, it's like, there's a it's, delay. It's just, yeah. It's like, hold on, you know, food's coming, hold on, don't die. But you know, this'll do for now. The problem is if you're not metabolically flexible and you stop eating, or even you eat a 80% fat diet, insulin, people have heard of insulin resistance by now. If you're not metabolically flexible, you have a high insulin level and insulin actually blocks fat from being released from fat stores. Mm. So you could have tons of fat, but if your insulin level is elevated, and I can tell you that most Americans insulin level is elevated, then you could stop eating. You could eat an 80% fat diet and it may take weeks for insulin to fall enough that you can start putting free fatty acids out to be turned into ketone. And that explains the keto flu, the Adkins blues. And it's not even that easy to get into ketosis from what I've that's, learned. It's actually very, I listened to Dr. Rhonda Patrick talking about that and how she had to keep testing herself and she just had to keep pouring fat on the things to even get into ketosis. And she could get kicked out super easily by too much spinach. But I've got the trick. Okay. And that's unlocking the keto code. Believe it or not, you don't have to eat a lot of fat to get into ketosis. Okay. Yay. Yeah. One of, so one of the tricks that I, in all my books, um, most people now have heard of MCT oil, medium yep. chain triglycerides. Yep. Medium chain triglycerides uh, are absorbed as a fat in a totally different way than any other fat. They're absorbed directly through the wall of our gut. And they, unlike any other fat, go directly to our liver, you know, do not pass go, do not collect $200 and are made instantly into ketones, no matter what you're eating. So wow. you, could, you could have a plate of spinach, you could have a fruit salad, please don't, but you could have a fruit salad and take a tablespoon of MCT oil and you will be in ketosis. Jeez. Nice. That's really helpful. I've got some of that. Yeah. Now. Uh, MCTs, medium chain triglycerides, and generally are named after the goat, capra. And so there's capric acid, caprylic acid, caprolic acid. They're all words for goat. Why did they name it for goat? Turns out that goat milk and sheep milk is 30% medium chain triglycerides, MCTs. Yes. Can I eat goat cheese then? So you can have goat cheese, you can have sheep cheese, you can have goat yogurt, you can have sheep yogurt. Well, I'm going to switch out for my cashew, fake goat oh, cheese cashew, and for the real thing. Yeah. And so you will make ketones just by oh. eating goat cheese and sheep cheese. Wow. And I've got tons of recipes in the book of... So you could, I mean, you could, you know, have yourself some goat yogurt and put some polyphenols, which we'll talk about in a bit, maybe, uh, in it, and you'll go into ketosis. The third way to do it is that time-restricted eating, uh, cutting the window that you eat food down to about six to eight hours a day, yeah. so is, will guarantee you that you will, if you're metabolic, metabolically flexible, you'll start making ketones about eight hours after your last meal. And by 12 hours after your last meal, you're, you're humming in ketones. But what's important, and this was a study of Italian cyclists, what's important is you want to go beyond just 12 hours eating and 12 hours not eating. You want to get to this sweet spot of about 16 hours of not eating. 
that's about an eight hour eating window. Mm. And in Italian athletes, uh, and you know, you're a great athlete. So what they did is they took these guys and they put them on a training table for three months and they all had to eat the exact same food. The one group ate in a 12 hour window. They ate breakfast at eight o'clock, they had lunch at one o'clock and they had to finish dinner at eight o'clock. The other group, same food, their first meal was at one o'clock in the afternoon. That was break fast. Their second meal was four o'clock in the afternoon. Their third meal, they had to finish by eight. So let's the same say. calorie amount, same just calorie different amount. schedule. Got it. Okay. Diff- that's it. Lo and behold, the only the shortened eating window guys, they had the same athletic performance, but they lost weight. The other guys didn't lose any weight. And one of these markers that I follow for longevity, insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1, mm-hmm. plummet, plummeted in the shortened window athletes, didn't change a bit in the other ones. Mm-hmm. So it was just the timing. So in the book, it explains why that happened. Wow. Ketones were being produced for about four hours longer in the shortened window athlete. And what ketones actually do, and that's why it's called unlocking the keto code is ketones are actually the key to making mitochondria protect themselves and to actually become inefficient at burning calories. And it's called uncoupling, inefficient, inefficient. And that's how they lost weight. And it turns out that telling mitochondria to protect themselves, to make more of themselves, get some more guys to help out. And to actually waste calories is actually how ketones work. And it's, it's 180 degrees opposed to how we used to think ketones made made you lose weight. How, how did you, I mean, it, Obviously, it's counterintuitive to think it is. you're training your mitochondria to protect itself and not use calories because you think any 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 disposal service that I can use to burn calories is part of my the sum of me. And what if I lose weight or gain weight? Correct. But it's all wrong. And this was actually discovered by uh, a researcher by the name of Martin Brand in 2000. And he wrote a very small paper, anybody can look it up, Uncoupling to Survive. That's the name of the paper. And he showed, yeah, and Uncoupling to Survive. And he basically proved that if you were starving to death, then you would have to have a mechanism to tell mitochondria who make the energy to protect themselves at all costs. Because if the mitochondria don't make it, who cares? Um, And to put all their resources into making more of themselves, who cares about the muscles, who cares about anybody else, protect yourself. Hmm. And so he showed that the more mitochondria protect themselves by not trying as hard to make energy because energy production damages mitochondria. And then he showed that Mm -hmm. if you look at super old people thriving at 105, They have the most uncoupled mitochondria of anybody. Because they wear out. Is that right? That's exactly right. Making energy is really damaging. And so, so we if, lose mitochondrial function over time bingo. because it wears it down. So, And the, the book is to- how to get your mitochondria to protect themselves at all costs. Wow. What are some other, I mean, I've kind of been dabbling in some of these spaces of mitochondrial function. Are there some other things that we can do to um, give it more of it uh, to, to protect itself? Polyphenols. Okay. Uh, so polyphenols are all those really cool yellow, orange, red, purple, blue compounds in plants. Mm -hmm. And strange but true, plants actually have mitochondria that are called chloroplasts. And oxygen damages our mitochondria, but we have to have oxygen. Can't live with it, can't live without it. (laughs) Plants, sunlight damages plant mitochondria, but they have to have sunlight, but it's damaging. So they produce all these colorful compounds called polyphenols to guess what? Uncouple their mitochondria. 
their chloroplasts to protect them. Then it's kind of like the circle of life from the Lion King. When we eat, plants that contain polyphenols, those polyphenols in turn uncouple our mitochondria. So this idea that we should be eating the rainbow really should be rewritten. We should be eating to uncouple our mitochondria. So I like list, I mean, for instance, the spice trade in the, in the middle ages, they didn't know it, but they were engaging in uncoupling their mitochondria. Olive oil contains polyphenols and uncouples your mitochondria. I think you're Ooh. olive oil's number one fan. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And it has the most polyphenols of any olive oil, 30 times more. Uh, so, and that explains why the Mediterranean diet with all its brightly colored fruits and vegetables and the olive oil and the red wine mm. perpetuates this longevity. And there's two blue zones, Sardinia and the Nagoya Peninsula in Costa Rica, Guess what their number one food is? Goat and sheep cheese. Oh, I'm Aha. moving there. I'm Aha. moving there. And the Sardinians who live up in the mountain that have goat and sheep live much longer than the Sardinians who live down by the sea. And the only difference in their diet is the goat and sheep cheese because they're, they're making ketones and the ketones are from the MCTs in the goat and sheep cheese and the ketones are uncoupling their mitochondria. Whoa. So this is blowing me away. And I know we have to wrap up and you have to go because you have patience because you're an amazing human and you still see people six days a week. Um, so can we get these polyphenols and take, uh, you know, consume MCT oil in any form or fashion? Is it best to do um, it in your coffee in the morning to start your day? Is that a great start? And, and, and maybe as a last question, could you, is there, do you have to completely go zero calories in that 16 hour window or could you have MCT oil in your coffee or something like yes. that? So MCT won't affect it. It turns out that, uh, good friend of mine, Walter Longo from USC, mm -hmm. um, has shown in humans that if you eat a nut bar, and he has a nut bar called the fast bar, and I have some, but if you eat a nut bar or a handful of nuts, not cashews, they're not nuts, mm -hmm. uh, you will not stop ketosis uh, for that okay. four hours. So that's actually exciting. So okay. yeah, have some MCT oil or have a handful butter? of nut. Uh, butter actually, if you get ghee, it's much safer. Got it. Because uh, most butter, unfortunately, has some casein A1 in it. A1. So ghee is better. Got it. Okay. Uh, I'm just, I can't wait to read that book. That's going to be amazing. Thank you so much for doing so much research and helping so many people. It's truly, truly magic. Thank you. Well, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. All right. Enjoy, uh, enjoy the rest of your day and all your patience. And let, let's seal your leaky gut. Uh, honestly, I need help because I'm on my way to the dermatologist tomorrow. And I know they're going to probably tell me some kind of antibiotic, but. Try, try to resist. Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.